boy's faith touches his community in Simon Birch. from his roles as Will Hunting and Private Ryan, Matt Damon stars as a very good poker player trying to use his skills to turn his life around in Rounders, one of five new movies kicking off the fall season as we begin our 24th year on Siskel and Ebert. I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. Our first film is Rounders, and I'm a poker player myself, and I specialize in the one game, Texas Hold'em, that is played throughout Rounders. And so let me state straight up front, that the poker and strategy in this film is first rate. And here's even better news. So is much of the drama, as Matt Damon's character has to fight his own ego playing the game, which has him dreaming of making a big score that will stake him to a professional career in Las Vegas. After he loses a lot of money in a big game, he gets some tough words from a much more conservative player who always is flush with cash, played by John Turturro. You did it to yourself. You had to put it all on the line for some Vegas pipe dream. While the poker in the film is accurate, Damon's advice and method of play isn't. He relies too much on tells, those giveaway facial tics and hand gestures that can reveal the strength of an opponent's hand. You were looking for that third three, but you forgot that Professor Green folded it on 4th Street, and now you're representing that you have it. The DA made his two pair, but he knows they're no good here. And Mr. Eisen is just futilely hoping that his queens are going to stand up. <laughs> just my Take it down. But Damon's biggest problem in the film, one that just won't go away, is his friendship with a self-destructive character nicknamed Worm, beautifully played by the fine young actor Edward Norton. After bringing him home from prison, Damon is immediately caught up in the danger surrounding Norton, who has a lot of outstanding debt. Not too long before a collector... You bought me up, Grandma? Yeah. Got a real sweet deal, too. 30 cents on a dollar. There's not a lot of faith in you out there in the business community. Great, so you're a banker now, Grandma. That's, that's really classy. Not exactly. I don't have to tell you my collection methods. Norton's character gets back to all of his old tricks, getting both himself and Damon heavily into debt. He is truly creepy. An angry screw-up who just won't go away. Hey, fellas. Hey, there. Hey, 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 Let this guy down to the bowling alley. He says he likes to play a little card. How you doing? How you doing? Do you know what I'm doing? Don't move me. 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 Don't move I don't think Rounders is anything more than just a couple of good character studies. That's no mean achievement, though. But in the case of the Matt Damon character, it's kind of interesting to me. I once asked a casino owner uh -huh. how many people play poker professionally in Las Vegas, like he wants to. Uh -huh. And he said, very, very few. And he said, the reason is that anybody who wants that for a life probably is bringing with them to Vegas a whole set of personal problems, uh, substance abuse, you know, inability to have a relationship, uh -huh. a money management, all kinds of things. And Damon, you know, has a few of those characteristics. He, he seems like he's perfect you know, in terms of his play, but you look for the flaws. So that's kind of interesting. Oh, he's going to have problems in Vegas. I enjoyed the movie, too. In fact, yeah. I would give it a thumbs up. But it's a yeah. sports movie. It's like a Rocky movie. It ends with a big fight. In this case, it's a poker game. Yeah. What uh, amused me, in a way, or maybe even concerned me, in a way, is that this is a pro-gambling as a compulsion movie. I would not recommend this movie as a training film at Gamblers Anonymous. He, <laughs> well put, but uh, as you said, he has a flaw and he's not gonna make it. It isn't just the bad penny that keeps turning up, you know, uh, the Edward Norton character. Yeah, the bad it, penny is inside. You got it. He's, yeah, one, yeah. he's one himself. But yet at the same time, it's an entertaining movie as long yes, as you don't yeah. take it very seriously as, a, as career guidance. Oh, well, that's a, <laughs> good. <laughs> I never ever occurred to me. Okay, next movie. And our next movie is a delightful and visually breathtaking animated feature named Kiki's Delivery Service. It's the work of Hayao Miyazaki, whose cartoons have outgrossed Disney features in Japan, 
and whose entire output has been purchased by Disney for release in this country. I love Miyazaki's work. I admire its visual grace and beauty, and I love the way it identifies with its young heroes and heroines who are more like ordinary kids than mythical superheroes. There's one thing not ordinary about Kiki, however. She's a young witch in training, and when she reaches her teenage years, she sets off with her pet cat, Gigi, to find a new town in which to practice witchcraft. The movie has been lovingly dubbed by Disney with an American cast, including Kirsten Dunst as Kiki and the late Phil Hartman as Gigi, her cat. Gigi, climb up and turn on the radio. I don't think I can handle it. Can you do it? Oh, great. Now I'm suddenly the flight attendant. In a new town, Kiki gets a job as a delivery girl for a pregnant baker named Asono, an Earth Mother voiced by Tress McNeil. Oh, my goodness! Oh. Kiki makes a pal, a young boy named Tombo, who goes on a dirigible ride and gets in a lot of trouble. Kiki! Tombo! Ah. Oh. The animation of Miyazaki is only now becoming familiar in this country, but he's the equal, I think, of the Disney animators at their best. In the pipeline is Miyazaki's Princess Mononoke, which until Titanic was the highest grossing film in Japanese history. Kiki's Delivery Service is direct-to-video. It's in stores right now, and I loved it. I enjoyed it very much, too, Roger. It has a different visual style yes, than the classic Disney uh, animators, and so that's one thing that catches your eye. Mm -hmm. But the story, I mean, Kiki is really almost on a conveyor belt mm -hmm. through this uh, story, and I was fascinated by someone who followed her raptly, never looked away. Mm -hmm. My three-year-old son. Yeah. Now, that amazed me. He happens to, uh, his favorite things are uh, monster truck rallies and that kind of <laughs> stuff, you know what I mean? He's a real boy. He liked this gentle story about a girl walking, you know, through, I mean, oh, there's exciting se uh, sequences and they're well animated, but not a word from him. And this kid likes action. It's surprising mm -hmm. that there is a narrative here and kids hook into it. Right. Coming up later, Alan Arkin stars as a down-and-out dad moving his family around the slums of Beverly Hills. Wake up. We're moving. Ken, we just got here. And coming up next, Ashley Judd and Oliver Platt befriend a remarkable boy named Simon Birch. Oh, this is the night. It's a beautiful night. And we call it a Heartwarming Disney classic that's brought people together for generations on video for the first time in a decade. Walt Disney's masterpiece, Lady and the Tramp, on video Tuesday, September 15th. Fall in love all over again. Quit hogging the cashews. I'm not. R2. I'm not. R2. I'm not. Animal. It's a cat. It's a beaver. It's a brown cat. It's a beaver. I think it's a marmot. That was a beaver. Are beavers nice? Yes. Look at him. There he is. Oh, yeah. He looked at me. I'm going to give He's him a nut. He's cute, isn't he? No. Beavers don't like nuts. I've never seen a beaver eat a nut. I've never seen a Everyone beaver. Everyone loves planters nuts. Fresh roasted taste. And they're cholesterol free. Oh, he's good. He's very good. Planters, relax. <laughs> Go nuts. I think that'll fit in the van. The world's greatest furniture sale is coming to an end. Every single item in Casey Fine Furniture's $9 million inventory is on sale. And to make sure this is the greatest furniture sale you've ever seen, take your choice of no payments until January 2000, interest-free. Or use your cash and save an extra 7%. It's the world's greatest furniture sale. And it's only at Casey Fine Furniture. Come in early. You don't have to be a morning person to love breakfast. At IHOP, you can be a noontime or a nighttime person, too. Take IHOP's tempting very berry breakfast. Two fluffy pancakes with luscious strawberries and creamy whipped topping and a generous helping of tangy blueberry topping in the middle. With two eggs, bacon or sausages, and hash browns, they say very berry is very hard to resist. Good thing you can enjoy it for just $3.99. And it's ready whatever time of day is best for you. Anytime's a good time for breakfast at IHOP. I say, what does coffee and donuts have to do with God? They're merely refreshments so people can socialize and uh, discuss the upcoming activities. Whoever said that church needs a continental breakfast? Simon. An independent thinking boy, a dwarf named Simon, interrupts a church service, and that's just one example of how he impacts his community, his family, and friends in Simon Birch. To my mind, one of the year's best and certainly most thoughtful and emotional movies 
It's suggested by a character in the beloved John Irving novel, A Prayer for Owen Meany, and both book and film have a spirituality absent in so much of today's popular entertainment. Little Simon believes that each one of us is God's instrument, and he means it. And that kind of talk sets him apart even at Sunday school. The wonderful actress Ashley Judd, as the mother of his best friend, comes to Simon's defense. We can't have him talking that way. It frightens the other children. Oh, I think it's you it frightens Miss Levy. What? Why would I be frightened of little Simon Birch? Because that child has more faith than you'll ever know. Ashley Judd is becoming one of those rare actors whose very presence in a film is a but guarantee of quality. Joseph Mazzello plays Simon's best friend. And you shouldn't talk about this hero stuff, Simon. Why not? Because it's weird. The other kids tease you enough as it is. I don't care. It's the truth. But you don't have any proof. I don't need proof. I have faith. 11-year-old Ian Michael Smith is completely effective, making his film debut as Little Simon. Jim Carrey plays the adult Joe, who in narration recalls the effects of Simon's spirituality. What faith I have, I owe to Simon Birch, a boy I grew up with in Gravestown, Maine. It is Simon that made me a believer. Simon Birch is more than gentle sermonizing. A singular event in the film challenges Simon's theories and is, by itself, an intensely dramatic interlude. That is a delicate balance, spiritual theories and action. But writer-director Mark Stephen Johnson manages it superbly. I was shocked to learn that his main previous screen credits include writing the Grumpy Old Men movies. I guess God's plan for him was to ultimately bring a prayer for Owen Meany to the screen. What a wonderful destiny. <laughs> I like this movie, too. Oh. I like the whole feeling of the town. I know that it's more of a Norman Rockwell town than a real town, this place in Maine, maybe 30 years ago. But nevertheless, in the evoking of that town and that little boy and his best friend and how they're both outsiders because the uh, larger of the two boys doesn't know who his father is. So he's kind of a misfit, and these two misfits get together. It shows a friendship that just transcends everything. And it's a funny movie. And it's a warm-hearted movie, and I loved it. Did the film hook you that much that you began to think about your own purpose and stuff like that? Uh, it didn't take that film. I've been thinking about that for a long time. My purpose is to give good reviews to movies like Simon Birch. That's what I'm on earth for. Well, I'm glad you arrived here today. When we come back, a comedy about a poor family in a rich neighborhood. Marissa Tomei stars in Slums of Beverly Hills. I'm not high. I'm bloated. Hey, Colorado. Is this a great country or what? This is a 7 News Doppler Max update. Good afternoon. I'm meteorologist Pam Dale. A few showers out there on 7 Doppler Max, most of them to the north. I'll have a complete 7-day forecast at 5. Channel 7 and Einstein Brothers Bagels could hand you the keys to an all-new 99 Oldsmobile Alero. Just go to your local Einstein Brothers Bagels and pick up an entry form. Then watch the premiere of ABC's Tuesday Night Comedies with Home Improvement, The Uglies, Spin City, and Sports Night. Premiering Tuesday, September 22nd on Channel 7. Start something new this fall. Did you ever notice unexpected expenses always seem to pop up at a bad time? Like right between paydays? But Advance America can help with an instant advance on your next paycheck. If you're employed and have a checking account, you can get the money you need now instead of waiting around for weeks so you can avoid bounced checks and costly bank charges. Advance America. Get the advance you need now. Call today, 1-888-68-CASH-NOW. So where's our new apartment this time? We're staying in Beverly Hills. It's just too early to show up is all. The Abramowitz family cruises through town in that clip from slums of Beverly Hills. And the father, played by Alan Arkin, doesn't make much money as a car salesman, but he wants his kids to live in Beverly Hills because of the good schools. So they move from one dumpy apartment building to another, sometimes skipping out on the rent. The family includes a 15-year-old daughter, Vivian, whose generous development causes nightmares for her dad. Get your bag and put on your vizier. 
can't wear a bra with it, Dad. It doesn't work. Well, you're hanging out of it. It's supposed to look like this. Everybody wears these. It's modern. Then it's... there's a new arrival in the family, a cousin with a wild reputation. She's just out of rehab, played by Marissa Tomei. Do you have anything for my nerves? Second all, Demerol, two and all. The family's new neighbor is a brash know-it-all named Elliot, played by Kevin Corrigan. I'm in for your neighbor. I'm Jewish. I like the raffish survival tactics of the family in slums of Beverly Hills, and I like the spunky performance by Natasha Leone as the teenage daughter, who has a funny way of saying exactly what she thinks and being quietly exasperated by her family's unpredictable lifestyle. But it's really Alan Arkin's picture, and he brings spirit and a certain poignancy to this single father who's trying to make ends meet. The picture's major flaw is a scene between Arkin and Tomei, which sticks out like a sore thumb. He makes a pass at her, and I didn't believe it, and it doesn't fit the tone of the rest of the film, which is really very sweet and funny. I agree down the line to the letter with you, because it is Arkin's movie. And I, what I liked about his character prior to that scene, which is a mistake, mm -hmm. is... Uh, He's a sweet guy. Well, you also know the territory that this film is describing. Yeah. There's a quirk in the real estate scheme out in uh, L.A. where you can live technically outside the city limits, but you still get your mail at, in Beverly. Your address is still Beverly Hills. Yeah. It's all for show. It only in, it, It's a classic Hollywood situation. But, and he wants to stay on that, skirt that edge, because... He needs to feel better about himself, either because he hasn't been able to put a career together. I think Arkin, who was 65, his character was 65 in the movie, probably thinks, gee, you know, as long as I decided to have this family so late in life, I'm going to do the best I can to get him into these good schools. Yeah, good picture. Okay, next film. And our next film is called Digging to China, an emotional character study that has some similarities to Simon Birch, and that involves a friendship between outcasts. The central character is a 10-year-old girl who retreats into a fantasy life as a way of coping with an alcoholic mother and an overbearing, blatantly sexual older sister. The time is the 1960s, and the girl's name is Harriet. In her schoolyard, away from her family's rural motel, Harriet awaits the arrival of a UFO that she hopes will take her away, far away. Uh, people? Massachusetts. That's Evan Rachel Wood, quite memorable as Harriet. Her mother is played by Kathy Moriarty of Raging Bull fame some 18 years ago, and she is more combative than caring with Harriet. Harriet, where were you going today? On a vacation. I thought we agreed that you wouldn't run away anymore. I wasn't running away. I was just taking a vacation. Honey, children don't go on vacations without their mothers. Harriet's life takes a radical turn, not when a UFO shows up, but with the arrival of a mentally handicapped man who winds up staying at Harriet's family motel. Kevin Bacon, using all manner of facial tics, plays Ricky, a character we don't get to know that well in this picture. But he and Harriet do share a tender, well-written moment revolving around whether their relationship has hit a dead end. <laughs> And that is merely one of many misunderstandings and shocking revelations laced throughout the script of Digging to China, a sincere film that ultimately felt like a series of exercises for the actors. On that basis, maybe it's not a surprise that it was directed by an actor, Timothy Hutton. He can't be faulted. It's the script of Digging to China that is so consistently offbeat that it loses any beat. I totally agree with you. Here are some really interesting characters, potentially especially those played by Kathy Moriarty and Mary Stuart Masterson. And I really found those performances to be convincing and true and deep, and I wanted it to be developed along a more human level. Instead, you get Behave. screenwriters punching it up. We don't need the UFO. We don't really need that kind of a Kevin Bacon character. We don't need the scene where she ties the helium balloons to a chair in order to fly, fly away, yeah. you know, uh, while the guy at the, at the yeah. circus apparently doesn't notice yeah. that all of his balloons have been stolen. I mean, these false notes keep undermining the real relationships here, and at the end, for me, they sank the picture. Yeah, let it flow. Let the actors do their thing. Let them do it. When we come back, a tribute to the great Japanese director Akira Kurosawa, who died this week.
epic movie making, Newsweek. Spectacular and timeless, Rex Reed. Fantastic offer, Sprint. Switch to Sprint, and Titanic on video cassette is yours. Titanic, a classic tale you're free to watch anytime you want. Switch to the best long distance, and we'll give you a certificate for the best movie of the year. Call 1 800 Pin Drop for details. When you give a solitaire, you say more. And you say it with more brilliance, more depth, more fire. Siskel and Ebert's Video Pick of the Week is brought to you by Nestle Raisinets. At the movies or at home, Raisinets. The world of film lost one of its grandmasters last Sunday when the great Japanese director Akira Kurosawa died in Tokyo at the age of 88. Along with Ingmar Bergman, he was one of the surviving giants from the post-war golden age of filmmaking, and his body of work includes an astonishing number of titles that should be seen by anyone who is serious about the movies. Consider, for example, Rashomon, his 1950 Oscar winner, that cuts between four different accounts of a brutal crime. Who is telling the truth? For example, was the wife brutally raped, or did she go with the bandit willingly? Look at them. In 1952, Kurosawa made one of the greatest of all films, Akuru, which starred Takashi Shimura as a dying bureaucrat who has spent his life in meaningless paper pushing and now vows to achieve one meaningful thing before he dies. Kurosawa's The Seven Samurai in 1954 starred Toshiro Mifune in the story of some penniless samurai who agreed to defend a village against bandits. This movie inspired a famous Hollywood remake, The Magnificent Seven. The Hidden Fortress in 1958 also inspired Hollywood. George Lucas says it gave him ideas for Star Wars, and these two characters inspired R2-D2 and C-3PO. Kurosawa made two great epics near the end of his career that are astonishingly beautiful. One was Kagamusha in 1980, about a thief who was asked to impersonate a great warlord. And the other is Ron from 1985, a medieval retelling of Shakespeare's King Lear. All of those titles are available on tape and Laserdisc, and Ron is on DVD, and a lot of his other films are on tape, too. To look at Kurosawa's work is to understand how widely and deeply the cinema can reach. Kurosawa once said, take myself, subtract movies, and the remainder is zero. In that case, he'll live forever. Oh, well, he certainly will. Uh, Roger, I think in his career, he was often thought of, and maybe the public thinks of him as a master of staging spectacle. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad that you emphasize the strength of Ikiru, because this man could direct the human story, the individual story, as well as he could do the oh, epic. Yeah. He could do both, or he could do it all. He could do just about anything. Exactly. We'll be right back in a moment. How's Max doing? He's doing okay. So how long before Max can play again? Well, the vet said Max will be back to his old self in a couple of days. Even the interior of the Chevy Blazer was designed to make you feel at ease. Chevy Blazer. A little security in an insecure world. Dad, aren't you forgetting something? Oh, right. 10, 10, 3, 2, 1. You're the one who told me we save over 18 t on every call if we dial 10, 10, 3, 2, 1 then one, and then the number. I love when you listen to me. Yeah, we even save 50% on calls over 20 minutes. That's right. You know, last month we were on the phone with your grandmother for a half an hour, and it cost less than two bucks. So I guess that the only thing you have to do is remember to dial 10, 10, 3, 2, 1 first. So remember... 10, 10, 10 3, 2, 1. I got it. I got it.
American Furniture Warehouse is having a birthday bash. Yeah! This handcrafted chestnut bedroom set features a queen-size bed with recessed panels and food legs for just $8.99. The Marin Dresser are just $12.98. The armoire is decorative end panels, a dovetail solid chestnut top, and is pre-wired for electrical and cable, just $10.97. Truly a beautiful collection with nature's signature on every piece. Second chances are rare. Life usually doesn't rewind. So when you get a chance to turn back time, grab it. Reach for enamel on. Toothpaste technology so advanced, it helps undo the damage food does daily to enamel. Only enamel on combines fluoride with liquid calcium to penetrate teeth, helping to rebuild enamel even stronger. Help undo the damage and rebuild enamel every day. Great tasting enamel on. A second chance for your teeth. Take another look at the movies we reviewed on this week's show. Two thumbs up for Rounders, starring Matt Damon and Edward Norton as gamblers who quickly get in over their heads. Two thumbs up for Kiki's Delivery Service, a delightful animated feature new in video stores. Two thumbs up, way up, for Simon Birch, starring newcomer Ian Michael Smith as a boy with unshakable faith. Two thumbs up for Slums of Beverly Hills, with Alan Arkin in a terrific performance. And finally, two thumbs down for Digging to China. And one more comment about Akira Kurosawa. We were both privileged, Roger, to see his last film, made in 1993. Matadaya, which means not yet. And this movie has never been picked up for distribution in the United States. I think it would be a great gift to everyone who loves Kurosawa yeah. if somebody were to pick that up and show it in this country, Matadaya. It, it, uh, it's a, a gift to all film goers. It's a, a terrific picture. Remember, you can hear our reviews on the web at siskel-ebert.com, and that same website also lists all of the TV stations that carry our show. Next week, we'll be back with reviews of more new movies, including One True Thing starring Meryl Streep, Renee Zelliger, and William Hurt, and also Rush Hour with Jackie Chan and Chris Tucker. Which one of y'all kicked me? That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed.